mostly from our favorite chief of police, but you know, from various other people is, you know, that you can't have a medical marijuana law because then there'll be medical marijuana in the parents' houses and the kids will get a hold of it. And you say, well, but without it, they can get a hold of their parents' morphine tablets or Oxycontin tablets or whatever. So if they're going to get in their parents' medicine cabinet, would you rather them get a hold of the marijuana or would you rather them get a hold of the Oxy? But that's still they never have an answer for that. Right, but right. <laughs> yeah, but still, I'm not in favor of anybody in their formative years using any legal substance. I don't think they should. But if a qualified physician believes that a underage person needs this medicine, then that, that's their job. Sure. Well, I mean, the way I look at it is they don't, they don't, don't say you harmed more or you hoped more, right? and they don't say to a two and a half year old, well, you know, you've got cancer, and I'd like to use chemotherapy, but you're too young. Yeah. They don't do that. They go, no, you're going to go through chemotherapy. Well, then why do you say that they're too young to use a medicine that might take the nausea away from them, but yet they're not too young to go through chemotherapy, or to be prescribed? I mean, right, right. Adderall, Ritalin, you know, all that. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 that's Ritalin, they handed out the candy. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. Yeah. But it's drug for your Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my, my little uh, nephew, creative kid, just all over the place. Get, that, get him on Ritalin, mm -hmm. and, you know, so he can kind of just shut up and get in line at school, you know? Well, there's been, there's been many cases of kids, you know, with autism and things like that that have come around with cannabis where they haven't known anything else. Yeah. And one in particular, a, a, a kid named Joey. 10 year old kid that, again, very artistic. And he basically uh, couldn't go to any schools. He was killing himself, knocking his head against the wall, things like that, stopped eating. He had lost half his body weight. And the doctors just told his mother, just take him home and he'll die. And his mother put him on cannabis. Well, what happens when you start using cannabis? You get the munchies, most people do. So he started eating. So he put his body weight back on. Another thing that happens with cannabis is you aren't mean anymore, you aren't mad. So he stopped hitting his head against the wall. Okay. And then this kid, 10 years old, had never spoken a word in his life. Well, when you get high, what else will happens to you? You start chatting, you start talking. He started talking for the first time. All because of cannabis. And he had, she had to go to court because they were trying to take the kid away from her because she, she was taking, giving him cannabis. Wow. And she won that court battle, luckily. So, you know, people just, they believe the hysteria that's been taught to them all their lives. And I don't blame them. I thought it was, I thought it was dangerous too. I was so different. Until I started using it. And then I realized this is not dangerous. It's benign. Uh, Irv, I noticed you're smoking as opposed to having like a capsule of cannabis that you're consuming. Uh, a lot of the police chiefs uh, that are dissenting with the current legislation are saying, oh, well, if it's not a pill, it's clearly not medicine. Can you explain why it is that smoking it would be more beneficial than consuming it for some people? Right. When you smoke cannabis, you titrate it. You get the effects of it almost immediately. So if you've got a medical problem and you're taking it for that reason, then once that medical problem clears up, you stop taking it. You don't need it anymore. You put it out. Where a pill, you can't titrate it as well, meaning it goes to your system, it goes through your liver, it takes 40, 45 minutes for it to react. And then some people think, what's well, not working, let me take another. And then all of a sudden, both of them hit you, and you overdose. You take too much. And you go to sleep, is what happens. So smoking really is the best form or vaporization. I don't have a vaporizer with me, so I don't vaporize when I'm traveling, especially. So smoking is the easiest way, and it's the best way to get to your system. And again, it does no harm to the lungs at all. People won't believe that it does because you're smoking. Well, you're smoking cigarettes, it might do harm to the lungs. But smoking cannabis clears your lungs up. So, um, smoking is the best way of delivering. Wait, wait, wait. Senator. Interesting. Um, with, you know, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I didn't, it was like I diagnosed on a Thursday into surgery and so forth. And the following Tuesday, I didn't have time to, to get involved or anything like that. But I had, to, um, I had to sneak out behind my house because everyone was against marijuana. I had to sneak out behind my garage before, uh, before my. Um, uh, radiation treatment in, in uh, to smoke it. and I, and I hadn't realized that like what am I why do I have to do this look at I have cancer um, I I'm, I'm, my mar marijuana is working better than my sixteen hundred dollar prescription for Zofran right. and I'm hiding behind my garage so my mother-in-law doesn't see me exactly. smoking it was ridiculous you know and that's kind of what propelled me into the into activism you know it's, uh, it's yeah just well when, once facing a, a life-threatening uh, disability or life-threatening disorder. It brings one to the realization that, hey, this is just a plant. 
That's all it is, okay? And I gotta go through cancer. It's like, and you wanna make me a criminal because I'm using this? So that's what people have to realize. And also people have to realize that diseases, you know something? They don't know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. They have no idea. So it hits everybody. It's all families. That's what really makes me realize that, you know, people should understand that everybody should be in favor of this, okay? It should be controlled. Nothing wrong with that. But take your situation, okay? The way this law is written, it wouldn't help you from what I've read about this law. Meaning you were diagnosed on a Thursday and Wednesday you were in? Uh, yeah, the following Tuesday. Okay, following the, Tuesday, okay. Knife, yeah. Gee, you have four days to grow plants? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's why, you know, that's yeah. why you need you need a way to be able to go and say, God, I just got diagnosed with this. They're so telling me I've got to go through radiation in four days, you know, and they're telling me, my doctor's telling me if I get the cannabis, it might take away the nausea, and you can go to buy some, you know, or with a doctor's recommendation. Because you don't have time to grow I've never grown a plant in my life. I wouldn't have to grow it. I mean, the federal government grows it. Okay, so I don't have to grow it. And the feds wouldn't allow me to grow it, first of all. I'd be breaking the law, just like everybody else would. Hey, hey Herb, I want to introduce you to Gary Lambert. He's a senator. He's on Health and Human Service Committee, uh, a Marine. And he was opposed, and then he supported it this year. Yeah, Gary, so turn it around on committee. Very good. Nice to meet Thank, you. Nice to meet you. Thank Definitely. you. And one of the important aspects I was telling him is with the Veterans Administration. Okay, my organization, Patients Out of Time, we're the only organization in the United States that's sanctioned by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association to teach doctors and nurses about medical cannabis to where they get continuing education credit to come to our conference or download our previous conference. We do it every two years, which was in Rhode Island two years ago. They get continuing education. We've also gotten the Veterans Administration to come out in favor. Now, what the Veterans Administration states is this, which is very important, is if a veteran is taking OxyContin, any kind of opiates, and they go to a VA center, and they take a blood test or urinalysis, and they test positive for metabolites of cannabis. The VA has instructed their doctors to withdraw treatment of that veteran, take away the opiates, withdraw, withdraw it. Unless you're in a state that allows it. If you're in a state that allows it, then you're fine. No problem. Just because you have cannabis in your system. We still, we still, we'll, still, we'll still treat you. So what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's not right. Where a veteran in Florida where I live or in Virginia where I grew up, and same here with New Hampshire, isn't afforded the same rights as veterans in 17 other states, a third of this country. So what I like to say to politicians is, you know, we talk about medical cannabis as a medicine, this, that, and the other, and I've argued this for 40 years, okay, 30 years legally. But now I'm going to argue this. Senator, let me ask you a question. Why are you against our veterans? And if, you, if, if there's no law in the state, then you are literally against veterans because they're not afforded the same treatment as other states. So that right there to me is a compelling argument that politicians are, should be in favor of veterans, should say, what can I do to help? Okay, if this is what you want, if this is what the VA says we need to do, then we need to do it because what's right for our veterans is what's right for our state. Yeah, I'm the chairman of the Veterans Affairs right. Committee, also a retired Marine. Mm -hmm. uh, can you send me a copy of where the VA is on board? I mean, I support the medical marijuana. I voted okay. against it before a few years ago. Right? Mm -hmm. But then I came back and I voted against the veto and supported it this year. Mm -hmm. But I have some issues with it, even though I'm mm -hmm. supporting it. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, the, when you're driving under the influence, mm -hmm. okay, any tests, uh, how, do, how do we handle that? Well, my federal protocol says that I'm allowed to operate dangerous machinery as long as I'm not intoxicated. Now, I get no high off cannabis. I never have. It's very unusual. Okay, it's not the norm. Okay. So when I'm stopped by a police officer and they tell me I can't drive with this and I show them the protocol, I go, am I intoxicated? They go, no. So again, your police officers are trained to be able to tell if somebody's intoxicated or not. A blood test doesn't work. If it shows metabolites in your system, that's because cannabis can stay in your system for over 30 days, if not longer. Because see, we, ha we have natural cannabinoid receptors all throughout our body. We manufacture natural cannabis. The THC content you're talking about. Well, the THC stays that stay, stays in your system, it's almost like I try to explain, people like to compare alcohol with, with cannabis. Now, let's say it's exactly the same, exactly the same substance, basically. Okay, today is Tuesday, okay? Saturday, a week ago, I had three drinks. Today, if they test me, and alcohol's the same as cannabis, I'm drunk, because it's in my system. But I had a drink eight days ago, so you know I'm not drunk, but my blood work says I'm drunk. That's the problem with cannabis. You could have smoked cannabis nine days ago, but your blood work's going to show you're high. So you, what you need to do is train who's in charge, such as your police officers, is to be able to tell, which is what they do on prescription drugs and other, other medicines, whether they're intoxicated or not. Well, we have here in New Hampshire the laws of the books. 
that cover um, drugs, or you know, if you're driving in the influence, or uh, right. driving in danger across the yellow line. So we have sure. laws. Yeah. So that's that's, that's it's the same. Right. Have that. They're it's behavior just, based. Right. It's just like it's just so like any prescription. Any it's just you're, like any so prescription. We drive well impaired on any substance, yes. whether it's oxycontin. So my question was on when I voted, I closed my eyes on that one because I'm saying, are we going to add to the court system now? And, and, and you know, sir, some, sir, let me just speak about uh, cannabis driving versus alcohol. And when you drive on alcohol, you're fine. Nothing's wrong. I can drive. I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm great. When you drive high, first of all, people don't plan to drive high. Very few people plan to drive high. People that normally don't get high or whatever go to a party and all of a sudden they get high, which is unusual, let's say. And now, oh God, I've got to drive. Well, they're thinking, I'm high, I've got to drive, and I don't want to, but I do. So you know how you can tell a lot of times whether somebody's driving high? Is they come up to a stop sign, and they stop, and they wait for it to turn green. Well, <laughs> Meaning they're extra cautious. They're extra cautious because they know they're high. That's like, the difference. I would like to give you my card with my email. And I'd like to see the veteran sign. Uh, like, give it to Matt. It's, it's, all, it's on our website. It's on our website. six years, and I've never seen anything come through my committee on veteran support. Well, that's why I'm letting you know. It's, right. it's through my organization, Patients at a Time, which the website's medicalcannabis.com. And see, the importance is my organization, like I'm not even a member of MPP, okay, they brought me up here. My organization is Patients at a Time. We're completely medical. What they do is they do the lobby work. They do what they do. We do the medical. They don't have experts. We're the experts. So what do we, we, we try to work together. We don't lobby. My organization has no paid members. We have no, no membership per se, but we are the experts in the United States and the world for that matter. At our conference last week in Tucson, we had doctors from Germany, from South America, from England, to Portugal. All the top cannabinoid researchers all come to our conference and testify. That's well, what I we're saying. But I got to tell you, we got to get three more senators. Well, get me in front of anybody. Around, get so. me in front of anybody you think you can. Yeah, I'll be here until 2.30. Thanks a lot. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for coming out. You guys do. But I definitely am looking for it because for future use of my health. Thanks so much. I've got to get on your lunch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I hate to break up this party. we got to get to a radio station right now. I'm sure we'll be back in this room later. One more quick question. Is there a number that you know how many veterans are having their medications taken from them because they're testing positive? Like, are they randomly oh, testing all veterans? I, I, or? I can give you numbers. Yeah, I would have no idea. I mean, we did have one patient in New Hampshire that's been one of our advocates get his care taken away in 2009. Just Google that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I'm wondering, are they randomly testing almost anyone they're treating's urine, oh, yes. or is it anybody they're treating for with opiates for pain? Right. Yeah. yeah. They test everybody. All right. Wow. You got everything? Do I have everything? Well, 